Colossians 1 verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Let's welcome our tea. We have heard of the Pentecostal theology. Perhaps we've heard of Reformed theology and Charismatic theology. But have you heard of Heavenly theology? Brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask now for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus by your Spirit to rest upon every mind in this place in order that their perception of what I say will be received as you intend. Cleanse my tongue, that I will be your transparent vehicle to convey all that needs to be said, nothing that doesn't need to be said. Help me to be very clear and very simple. And may this word change lives and bring great honor and glory to your name. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you today about the theology of heaven. Paul said, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. The saints in light are the saints in glory. They're those who have gone on before us. And they are in heaven now. They recognize each other just as Moses and Elijah were recognizable when Jesus was transfigured. They're free of pain, free of sickness, free of temptation. But the point I want to make today is they have an understanding of God that is clear to them now, wasn't as clear when they were on this earth. Because here below, we see through a glass darkly. And all of us, as we get older, find things clearer. Uh, Things are clearer to me today than they were 20 years ago. Uh, Many years ago, I had the high privilege of sitting at the feet of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. I have often said that no preacher in church history was blessed as I was that I sat at his feet week after week after week for four years. He vetted every sermon I preached, and we went through so much. But there were times when I said, Doctor, you didn't say this in this book. Uh, When we were going through Galatians, he was helping me understand the law. I said, but you didn't say this in your book on Romans. And uh, I was getting into a little bit of trouble over what I was preaching. Uh, And they would say, You've said things doctor didn't say. And I never said, well, he's the one that told me this week because I didn't want to cause any controversy or be defensive. But the truth is, I went back to him. I said, doctor, I'm getting in trouble for what I'm teaching. And you didn't say this when you were at Westminster Chapel. His reply was, it's clearer to me now than it was then. Well, I know what he means by that. And so we're talking about those in heaven now. They have a theological understanding of God that they didn't have clearly on earth. So the question is, what do the saints in glory believe? Last time I dealt with the question of how much can we experience God because they now are in the presence of God. Well, when Paul talked about having a taste of the inheritance of the saints in light, that means here below, we can have a taste of how real God is, but also a taste of clear understanding of theology. You see, there is no false doctrine in heaven. There's no rebellion in heaven. There's no heresy in heaven. 
And so the saints in glory, who, as I said, saw through a glass darkly uh, before they went to heaven, are described in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23, as the spirits of the just made perfect. Spirits of the righteous made perfect. For example, let me put it this way. How much theology do you suppose the converts of the Apostle Paul knew? Where did they get their theology? There were no Bibles there. I think it's easy to forget this. In the early church, they did not have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They didn't have Romans. They didn't have Galatians. It was a period where there were no Bibles. So whatever did they believe? Well, here's the explanation. A high level of anointing on the preaching and on those who listened. There was such an acute presence of God. It carried with them clear thinking so that they could immediately spot what was false teaching. And so we know this. Because nobody had their Bibles, what happened was that God compensated they're not having Bibles with a great measure of his presence. We can only imagine. We can only imagine what it was like when there was such a presence of God. For example, Ananias and Sapphira lie to the Holy Spirit and they're struck dead. People do that today. They're not struck dead. In Corinth, there were those who unwisely jumped ahead, did what they th thought was the Lord's Supper, abused it, and some of them got sick. Some of them are weak all the time, and some died. I'm sure since people have done that with the Lord's Supper, but they still live, they're perfectly fine. The point is, in that day, there was such a measure of the presence of God. This is why John could say, 1 John 2, 20, you have an anointing, you have an unction from the Holy One, you understand things. In fact, he said, 1 John 2, 27, you don't need that anybody teach you, because the anointing does it. So that's what was the case when they didn't have Bibles. Well, now, the saints in light, they are able to see clearly what is true. So when Paul said, that we are partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. It means we get a taste of what the saints in glory feel and what they believed. Uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing to know that God can give us the anointing and will make scriptures clear to us. Uh, and uh, as Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones used to say to me, a lot of people don't know this was his view, the Bible was not given to replace divine revelation or the miraculous. The Bible was given to correct abuses. And so the assumption was people had the truth, but they needed the Bibles, and they came, you know, sadly, not as soon as they may have wanted, uh, but in God's providence, uh, uh, Colossians, for example, was written probably around 60 A.D., well, that means from 30 A.D., approximately when Jesus died on the cross, 29, 30, something like that, for 30 years, nobody had Bibles. And so, what we know is that in glory, the saints see how real God is. They know what is true about God. In a word, they've got sound and solid theology. All right, we now can deduce a bit of that by reading Colossians. We deduce from this epistle what the theology of heaven is. And there are things I want us to see today. First of all, the theology of grace. Grace. How come you are a Christian? Do you know? It's because of what God did. You're saved, not because you chose, but because God chose you. 
You say, but RTI, I, I definitely chose it. I know that. And this is why we sometimes need to be reminded. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. One version puts, puts it, not of your doing. You may thought it was what you did. But here's what Paul says. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. It was the Father who did it. Uh, heaven will be filled with people who are there because the Father did it. And we might be surprised to see who's there. Do you know what it's like to go to a, a party or a place where it's by invitation only and you look around and you wonder, who else has been invited? And you go up to somebody and say, oh, how'd you get here? Or, I didn't expect to see you. I wonder if it will be like that in heaven. We look around and say, oh, how nice to see you. And they look at you and say, well, I'm surprised to see you. <laughs> but we're all there. We don't deserve it. It goes back to a number of years ago, I was invited to meet Margaret Thatcher when she was prime minister. I was invited to pray at a particular gathering, and, and I was offered 15 minutes with her. And uh, it was a wonderful moment. And uh, then, when the time was up, who do you suppose was waiting to, to, to greet her? The Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, the Vice President of the United States, the ambassador to St. James Court, all they did is say, glad to meet you, Prime Minister. And here I am watching that, I think, well, I've been, I've been with her <laughs> without them. But then I heard them say, let's get a photo. And so I, well, I knew my place, so I, I stepped back. But then they said, no, oh, Dr. Kendall, we want you. Want me? I'm here as Margaret Thatcher, Chief Justice, Vice President. And I'm on the front row, and I think, I feel like a fraud. <laughs> but I knew what to do. <laughs> as if I belong there. <laughs> but that's the way it will be. We all are saved because of what God did. Jesus said, John 6, 37. By the way, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, it's known as the hard sayings of Jesus. Here's one of them. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. All that the Father gives me. Who are those? Well, it's called God's elect. So God's chosen will come to Jesus sooner or later. Some are converted when they're young, some middle-aged, some when they're old. Uh, John 6, 44, words of Jesus. No man can come to me unless the Father which sent me draw him. You see, the reason you're saved, it's what the Holy Spirit did. You say, well, I chose. You thought it at the time. But at the, after a while, you get to know God's ways. You think, it was God who enabled me to do that. As a matter of fact, Jesus had to say to the disciples, they thought they chose him. I'll guarantee you, when Peter followed him, he thought it's what he did. You know what Jesus said to the disciples? You haven't chosen me. I've chosen you. And says John, we love him because he first loved us. But here's an illustration of Charles Spurgeon. He said, imagine a big pearly gate and on the front it says, whosoever will may come. And you walk through. And then you turn around and you see on the other side of the pearly gate, chosen from the foundation of the world. We are aware that it is what God did. Now, there are two things Paul has said that we have. Redemption, that means we've been bought with the blood of Christ. And forgiveness of sins, that's what is required to get into heaven. And we have these now. So what we have in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14, that 
becomes the launching pad for Paul's description of Jesus for the next several verses. All right, redemption. There are two theological words you need to get into your vocabulary. One of them is propitiation. It's a word you don't find in a lot of modern versions, translations. They just make it atonement, and they miss the meaning. It's one of the reasons I recommend the ESV. It translates it in Romans 3, 22, 1 John 2, 2, propitiation. You say, what's the point? Oh, it's what the blood of Jesus does for God the Father. You see, most people don't care what's in it for God. We're living in the what's in it for me generation. What's in it for me? Well, there is a word for that too. It's called expiation. Your sins are washed away. That's what's in it for you. But what's in it for God is that the blood that Jesus shed satisfied his justice. And that's the reason you're going to go to heaven. And you should be thankful for this. Spurgeon said there's two more words you need to get in your theological vocabulary. Are you ready for this? Substitution and satisfaction. What's that mean? First, Jesus was your substitute. First of all, in his life, but also in his death. In his life, he lived perfectly for you. He kept the law. In his death, he shed his blood, and he was your substitute. But the other word, satisfaction. Again, because the blood satisfies the justice of God. Another thing now about the theology of heaven, and that is the contrast between two kingdoms. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, a deliverance was required for the transition from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the word deliverance means to be set free. Uh, Paul the apostle, on the road to Damascus, when he was converted, Jesus told him what his mission would be. And that is to preach a gospel that would change people from the darkness that they were born in to light. You see, they had been blind. Are you aware of this? Not only are people, whoever they are, whatever nation, whatever the background, born in sin, they're born in sin, but there's something else at work. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, the God of this world has blinded them. Not only are they born in sin, that means that they have a propensity. They love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But on top of that, a blindness is what Satan does. And when you are with lost people, you've got to remember they're blind. <laughs> You might like to know that this morning I was on BBC radio in Bournemouth, uh, going to Bournemouth this week and going there with Lyndon Bowering, Graham Kendrick's coming to sing. We're doing an event in Bournemouth and so BBC wanted to interview me and they, they did it this morning. And the interviewer, bless him, he didn't have a clue. I could tell he had no idea what I was talking about when he answered questions that were put to him. But this is the way it is. We're dealing with the world. They are blind. They are in dominion to sin. And Paul calls it darkness. Darkness. But here's the thing. The theology of heaven, a sober understanding of the devil. You see, the world doesn't believe in the devil. They make, they make fun of it. People watch their astrology charts and they think it's harmless. I want you to know it's not harmless. Satan's very real. This is clear in heaven. And in heaven, they have this understanding. So Paul could say, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And no doubt he did at times. And we all wrestle against flesh and blood. But Paul says, I know the enemy. The real enemy is the powers of darkness, the rulers of this world. Well, one is in the devil's grip. 
until deliverance comes. Conversion is therefore supernatural. It is a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. But in this is the theology of the kingship of Jesus. We're talking about kingdom, domain of darkness, kingdom of light. Why kingdom? Because at the right hand of God, Jesus is seated on a throne. He is King Jesus now. Ancient Israel wanted their own king. They went to Samuel and said, give us a king. Samuel said, please, don't even think about it. Oh, they said, we want a king like other nations. Samuel said, don't think about it. Don't go there. And he began to tell them his, what's going to happen if you have a king. Oh, we want a king. And God says, let them have their king. You see, they wanted a king that they could see. The idea of God being king, that's not good enough. They wanted a kingdom that they could be in and feel that Jesus, sorry, uh, that uh, uh, they had a king that they could visibly see. Well, now, the theology of kingship is this. I am your king, and we're transformed into a kingdom, into the invisible church. Do you know about that phrase? What's the difference between the visible church and the invisible? Well, look around. This is the visible church. We all see each other, visible. But when you're born again, you're born into the kingdom of heaven. It's the invisible church, God's people throughout the world. You're part of that. Well, um, Jesus reigns from the right hand of God, and he will stay there until all his enemies are under his feet. And we come now to the main focus of the theology of heaven. And what do you suppose it is? The theology of heaven is one where Jesus Christ is the centerpiece. He's front, he's center, he's everything. How do we know this came up? Well, Paul said, we're transferred into the kingdom of his beloved Son. Where did Paul get that phrase? Well, I know when it was first stated, Matthew 3, 17. When Jesus was baptized, a voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son. At the Mount of Transfiguration, to which I just referred, there was Elijah, there was Moses, and Jesus, and Peter, you know, could get in the flesh the worst of anybody and said, oh, this is wonderful. Let's build three kingdoms. Jesus didn't realize that he was to be the main one. They thought, this is good. This is flattering to Jesus. Here he quoted Moses. We're going to build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And suddenly, nobody's there but Jesus. And a voice comes from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased because the Father loves the Son. I do not have the vocabulary, the ability to convey to you how much the Father loves the Son. Listen to these words in John chapter 3, verse 35. He says... I can tell you, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. John 5, 19 and 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Here's a thought for you. God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. This is the meaning of the phrase, in Christ, used by Paul hundreds of times. In Christ, we're joint heirs with Christ. In fact, at the end of the high priestly prayer of Jesus, 
John 17. He prayed that we would see that we are loved by the Father as much as Jesus. It's a wonderful thing. But what can never be exaggerated is how much the Father loves the Son. Well then, having mentioned God's beloved Son, here's what Paul does. He smoothly and subtly introduces one of the most sublime descriptions of the Lord Jesus Christ to be found anywhere in the New Testament. For some reason, these Colossians were faced with all kinds of strange teachings. And what follows is that Paul teaches them the truth as opposed to these false teachings by displaying the theology of heaven. You say, what is the importance of teaching? Oh, I can tell you, it's everything. Hosea said, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. You need to be able to recognize false teaching. Now, when they had the anointing in great measure, as I said, they could spot it. Oh, it would come up on their radar screen. They had so much of the Holy Spirit that heresy, immediately they were spotted and rejected. But for some reason, don't ask me why, because I don't know, but there seemed to be a waning of the presence of God but then the Bible comes along, the scriptures, and it will let you know what the theology of the early church was to be. Well, the Son, says Paul, is the image of the invisible God. Now, there's certain things that we know about God. It's pretty obvious that God is invisible. You can't see him. You see, that's what people don't like about God. They want a God that they can see. They want a God they can feel. And there are certain things the Bible even adds to it as if it was needed. For example, Jesus said in John 4, 24, God is spirit. Means you can't see him. Um, in fact, John 4, 24 confirms this. But Jesus speaks to the woman at the well. In John 1, 18, John says, no man has seen God at any time. As a matter of fact, if anybody were going to get to see God face to face and actually see the face of God, it would have been Moses. Moses prayed, oh Lord, I beseech you, show me your glory. In Exodus 33, 20, God says to Moses, no man can see my face and live. Well, you may ask the question, what does God look like? Well, the answer is, Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. And so what Paul is saying now in our text today, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Our God is spirit. The reason we have to do what we do by faith alone, the reason that we're saved by faith, we can't see these things. It's only through hearing, through the hearing of the word. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But see, the world wants to see. Uh, take Psalm 115. Verse 3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. But then he goes on. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but they do not feel, feet but they do not walk. You see, the world wants to see something. That's why uh, the atheist says, oh, I'll believe it when I see it. The trouble is, if you see it, it's not faith anymore. What makes faith faith is you don't see. God is spirit. That's why faith is required. But Paul is making a point. It is the biggest point you can imagine. Jesus is not invisible. The truth is, people saw him. They touched him. In fact, 
When John wrote his epistle, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, opening words, our hands have handled him. We touched him. We touched him. Even after the resurrection, Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, come here. Give me your hand. Here, feel, feel. Here, Thomas, take your hand and feel in my side. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 24, verse 39, Jesus said to the disciples, you know, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones. Come on, touch me, touch me. The reason that this is so important that Paul is fighting against a false teaching and that false teaching suggested, even explicitly stated, that Jesus did not really have a body. You just thought he did. Now, we need to know this. People saw Jesus, they touched him, uh, and Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Uh, by the way, uh, people ask this question. We all ask it. We all wonder it. Uh, will we see God the Father in heaven as being separate from Jesus? Do the saints in glory see the Father? Well, we all ask this. I only know one thing for sure. We're going to see Jesus. We're going to see Jesus. And in the book of Revelation, he's portrayed as the lamb that was slain. Whether there's more than that, speculation. But I can tell you this. We will see Jesus. And this false teaching that I've mentioned was known as Gnosticism. From the Greek word gnosis, that means knowledge. Now, these Gnostics, they were clever, they were sly, they were dangerous. They would flatter Christians and they would say to them, oh, what you have is so good. Your teaching is wonderful, but we can make it better. And of course, people will always be interested in something like that. Is, is anything better than this? But that's the devil. You need to know this about the Christian faith. Listen to me. The Christian faith is unimprovable. The Christian faith is never to change. In fact, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, is in the context of teaching. Do not depart from this. Jesus is the same. The doctrine is the same. We are not to try to make the Christian faith look better than it is. All we need to do is to proclaim it. It doesn't change. Jude said, earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. It's an unchangeable teaching. But the word uh, Gnosticism was applied to those who claimed to have a new way of knowing. And their new way of knowing was to make Christianity looked better, and a facet of this Gnosticism was called docetism. That comes from the Greek word dokeo, that means to appear or to seem. So the important thing to know about the Gnostics, they said Jesus did not really have a body. He only appeared to have a body. And that became the era of the early church that they had to fight. And this is why Paul wrote Colossians. This is why you have a warning against all these teachings that would get Christians off the rails theologically. The theology of heaven smashes this heresy to bits because Jesus was truly a man. He was visible. He was touchable. Or let me put it this way. The Father is invisible. The Son is visible. The Father is invisible. The Son is visible. And then Paul adds this. He's the firstborn of all creation. Now, what that means is this. Of all those born in creation, Jesus was First, he's number one. It's a term of dignity. 
a term of dignity. For example, in ancient Israel, the firstborn got double the inheritance. And we learn from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, where Jesus is the express image of the person of God, and he received an inheritance greater than the angels. In other words, this term, firstborn, means that in all creation, Jesus is number one. Think of all creation, the planets, the stars, flowers, animals, human beings. Jesus is number one. He was a man. He was born. He had a birth. He was the son of the Virgin Mary. What did he look like? Now, I've got a view on this. Will I be forgiven for just a tiny bit of, shall we call it, sanctified speculation? Here's what I think. Jesus looked partly like Mary and partly like Adam that was created from dust in the Garden of Eden. And so I think when we see Jesus, we see Mary, and we will see Adam, by the way. He'll be in heaven. I, I wouldn't be surprised. He looks a little bit like Mary, a little bit like Adam, because that's the way God made the first man. And, of course, we all want to say that he looks more like us. Uh, in Kentucky, we would say he was certainly white and spoke with an American Kentucky accent. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Luis Palau? He's the Argentinian evangelist. He came to see me one day, came into the vestry, and he said, R.T., did you hear about these two men arguing whether Jesus was white or black? I know, tell me about it. Well, the white man said, he's white. The black man said, no, he's black. The white man says, he's white. The black man says, he's black. And they got into such an argument as they were driving down the motorway they were fighting verbally and had a car accident. They were both killed. But on the way up, they were saying, he's white, he's black, he's white, he's black. And they came to St. Peter's at the pearly gates. And St. Peter said, welcome to heaven. Well, they said, we want to know, is Jesus white or black? Relax, sit down. In a minute, you'll find out for yourself. In came Jesus. Buenos dias, senores. <laughs> Jesus was a man. He was born. He had a birth, the son of the Virgin Mary. The paradox is he was not created but he was born. He was not created, but he was born. Jesus was and is the God-man. 100% God, 100% man. Does it mean that he is 50% God and 50% man? He was 100% God, 100% man. And so remember this about Jesus. He was God as though he were not man. He was man as though he were not God. But make no mistake, he was truly and thoroughly man. So the theology of heaven is a clear understanding of God and his son. But the enemy in the early church was not so much over the deity of Christ. They had to fight for that too, of course. But the enemy was, because of these Gnostics, it spread around that Jesus wasn't really a man. And they had to fight to show that he was a man. And the result was they came up with a creed. Probably second century. We don't know exactly who wrote it. Some say Barnabas. Uh, there was a superstition since it's 12 statements that each of the 12 disciples wrote a sentence. And they call it the Apostles' Creed. Uh, I doubt that very much, but we do know this. It was written to refute the notion that Jesus wasn't really a man. Do you know the Apostles' Creed? 
Uh, in previous churches, I've taught it. One of my church in Fort Lauderdale, we would say it every two or three weeks. Uh, and I would like you to say it with me. Would you please stand? Everybody stand. There will be put on the board in a couple seconds. Out loud, all together. Here we go. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and the life everlasting. Amen. May God, by the Holy Spirit, apply this word today to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.